Thank you everyone for joining. I think you're going to really enjoy this webinar. I'm Peggy Secrets. I think you all know who I am, but you know, just for the recording's sake, I guess. And I'm very happy today to introduce you to a friend of mine and a colleague, Graham Pan. So Graham is in Australia. So he's just starting his Wednesday morning and with a cup of coffee, you know, so he, he chose to be with us instead of going out for breakfast. <laughs> and we appreciate that. Let me tell you a little bit about Graham because he's got kind of an interesting background. He's worked as an industrial chemist, an international marketer, a meat industry consultant, as well as a farm consultant to many family and corporate farms. He does have a special interest in regenerative farm businesses, helping farmers to be profitable. He's also a HMI, Professional Certified Educator, and that's how we've met and worked on some projects together. He's trained farmers and herders and spoken at universities in, and conferences in Mongolia, India, Brazil, USA, and Canada. His consultancy and training businesses deliver workshops across Australia, as well as internationally, to cropping and grazing farmers and covers topics such as farm financial health checks, landscape function plan grazing, and forage and cover cropping. His teaching material comes from on-ground research and has been confirmed to work in practice. So not no theory here. So today Graham's going to share with us his knowledge about the concept of safe to fail trials. So we can begin to implement them here within our SEER project. Thank you, Graham. It's all yours. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, uh, Darren. It's, it's great. I'll just start, share my screen and get started. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me along and thanks for NCAT for uh, providing the opportunity. I've just put up a few logos of... Um, where I'm interested and where I'm working. So I manage uh, the Native Grass Association, uh, Stiper down the bottom right there, and um, on the board for another not-for-profit in Tasmania, and also a member of HMI and Savory Institute. So trained in the mid nineties um, uh, with, uh, with uh, Alan Savory and then been involved with them. The, um, I won't go too much into anything that I've done, but I have done a lot of meat work, uh, very much uh, sort of a cattle focus for Australia, but um, also do a lot of work with sheep, with people. So um, this was the response for the, um, for the survey I sent out. So what are the big barriers? And the big barriers there are really clear that... Uh, very quickly after people have done some training, the knowledge and information becomes less of a barrier um, and the time and the fencing and the water, that convenient infrastructure, and I'll, I'll keep coming back to that. Yeah. And I think the big sleeper is the suitable livestock. Um, a high proportion have been trained, so I thought that was really interesting um, that a high proportion of the people are being trained in some sort of um, rotational grazing. Um, I've got some questions and I'll come back to most of them. So how do we get the next generation motivated and interested? Um, and the other one on quite a detailed uh, question on safe to fail sort of thing. So it's not a proprietary system. It's just I, I pinched it off a man named um, Dave Snow, who runs a company called Kenefin. Kenefin Company, and they study um, complexity is their thing. And it's out of, um, he's out of the computer industry. And so you can use safe to fail trials on everything. So it's the way we reduce unintended consequences in a, um, in a complex situation. So, um, and then I'll go through and answer the bottom part. So can you do it on a crop? And, um, and how you can't um, you can't do it across the entire acreage because it sort of is a way of steering you, and you can't steer the whole property 
in a safe to fail way. So I'll keep coming back to that. Am I speaking too fast? Is that clear enough? Anyone? Great. Um, just quickly, I always like to start with this. The red lines are debt in Australia, the blue lines gross income, and the green lines net farm income. We've got these declining terms of trade, uh, which is sort of the gap between the blue and the green um, is basically the um, inputs into the business. So um, these last couple of figures where it jumps up are all forecast. And as, uh, as everyone knows, the price of inputs have gone berserk in Australia as well as they have in the US. So I use that as a basis to sort of start with farmers that really this gap here is not getting any better and it will continue to widen. And I believe the main driver is a focus on production um, rather than profit. So um, in Australia, and I'm assuming the same for you, Everyone just starts every research project, every, every piece of advice is this will increase your production. I'm saying that that's the black hole that stops us from being profitable and restoring land health and biodiversity. So this is a guy that uh, I've worked with a bit. He sort of did his PhD in risk in agriculture, Tim Hutchings. Um, uh, as part of his succession plan, handing over the farm to his boys. Um, and I think it's really important that it's about minimising losses rather than maximising production. And it's the losses that thre threaten the survival of farm businesses. Uh, you're allowed to stop me at any time if uh, you'd like to. These are the three main risks in agriculture. And I like to put it up because I thought that market price was sort of number one. But when you look at um, what drives the money through a farm business. It's actually debt compounds down, then seasonal. You know, in Australia, that's mainly rainfall risk. So I think it would be pretty similar in Texas. And then market prices third. That's the order that they impact the farm business. So um, I like to start with, well, you know, what's a design that reduces that risk? So this is uh, the Coglins. They've got four and a half thousand cows um, in New South Wales, and they've just expanded into another property in Victoria. And they had 2,000 cows in one mob and two and a half thousand cows in the other. And they got 20% debt on the land. So when they buy new land, they, they, uh, they get, uh, we'd say a gist, um, rent the land out for people with cows and calves. So, uh, so that they've got no debt, no rainfall and no market price risk uh, while they build up their own heifer numbers and they keep more heifers. Their seasonal risk, they have a long recovery with one mob and that sort of reduces that seasonal risk and I'll come back to that. And then their expenses, they keep at less than 20% of their selling price. So I just want to put that in the notes. It's really um, the basis of where I work is that I have a focus on profit, not on production. So uh, they'd be running at half the uh, stocking rate of the district that they're in on both their two properties. One's in a low rainfall, one's in a high rainfall. But they make a lot of money out of this business, low risk, make profit every year by having this design. So. I'm saying it's not an efficiency step, it's a redesign step. How can you redesign the business so that, um, so that you can actually make money all the time? This one, uh, I think I, I like this sort of, you know, just a recent paper that you know, in the last 12,000 years, we've uh, probably removed quite a fair bit of carbon out of the soils um, and quite a lot sort of um, in the area that I always farmed, which was down here in southern southern Australia. Um, so just, you know, that's sort of how I set the context when I'm talking with people. And then um, everyone says that we have no, we have no definition of how we're going to use agriculture to restore uh, land health and biodiversity and farmer well-being. 
Um, you know, we've actually got farmer and rancher, well, sorry, we use farmers for ranchers and uh, cropping people. So, um, so, but this is what I do. I'm, I'm saying that people and money are nested within this increasing, increasing health of the landscape, increasing biodiversity, increasing, um, you know, so not a trade-off. So a lot of people I still with, work with want to trade work hours or well-being scores or profit for the land health. And they're, they're trying to juggle the three. And I'm saying, no, you need to put them within this, um, nest them within that increasing landscape function. I use this definition for landscape function grazing or, you know, whatever. I don't mind what people call it. I'm well and truly over that after 30 years of doing this work. That within that increase, the re sorry, the reason I like it is that they're auditable. Each one is measurable. And the problem we have is that are we actually looking at this properly so that we can say, are we getting better or are we getting worse? So I'm not trying to do good, bad. I'm trying to do better or worse. So in, within this, do you know, uh, low risk profit's really important. Um, you know, we're in a, a high rainfall period at the moment. Uh, and so everyone's doing it easy, but you know, it's just around the corner, um, you know, the next drought in Australia. So, you know, how do you skip over droughts? How do you do all this sort of work? So that's what my, um, my is long-term profit, decadal profit, not just sort of making a lot one year, losing it all the next year. So I was just going to go through this increasing landscape function and define landscape function. So um, landscape function is just a way of monitoring the soil surface so that you can, um, you can predict uh, how it's functioning underneath the soil. So we impact the soil surface as ranchers and, and farmers. So we need to know that it's what we do to that soil surface. So this material work was done and it's peer reviewed um, by David Tongway and Norm Hindley. And that's David Tongway uh, training myself and Colin Sice and sort of, you know, you run transects, you divide it up into the different sort of categories of perennial patches and interpatches, and then you measure from there. So the full process is available um, and all the material, uh, but we, I use an estimation. I've struggled to get uh, uh, ranchers to do it. So, um, so it, this was from a uh, one of the groups I run. There's a there's a retired pediatric surgeon on on the group. So he's. I said to the, I need someone to do. Um, I'm trying to get them to activate so that they train back at me rather than me just train at them. And so he did this for landscape function that there's two types of health assessment. Yeah, you can do the bloods, you can do the biopsy, you know, you can get into the pits and dig the carbon or do the cores, or you can do the health assessment at the surface, which I really liked. So, so he was doing this you know, medicine uh, gut biome versus soil biome. He did a whole raft of this. So... Um, I really liked it. So, um, but then I asked him, what's going on here? You know, what's he actually checking for? And his wife had to stop him because he was going off into a two day lecture sort of, of, of how that was all gonna happen. So yeah, so we're looking at the soil surface. You can predict the soil health from the soil surface. The leading indicator is the soil surface. So in landscape function, we measure stability infiltration and nutrient cycling. I couldn't find a good image of nutrient cycling that I was happy with. They either had tree roots that were inappropriate, sort of, you know, that actually went deep down, or they had soil surfaces that were not covered. Or, you know, so it just drove me crazy. So this is from a project we did on increasing soil carbon. And that was the change in that, that top part of the soil surface that we achieved over two years. I see this as being very exciting and very quick to turn around. I was used to get a bit flat, you know, because in Australia, we'd say, oh, it took us 200 years to wreck it. 
it's going to take us 400 years to fix it. Uh, that was what I was taught when I was going through university. And I know now it took us 200 years to wreck it and you can fix it in two years, but you have to be single focus. Um, it's still profitable, um, but it's completely different. It, it is a redesign. And I think that that's the problem is it's too big a step for a lot of people. Um, this is simplified landscape function. I've taken out quite a few of the, um, of the different soil uh, indicators and, and soil surface. So, so this is what you measure on the left and this is what you get a score for, stability or lack of erosion, water infiltration and nutrient cycling. And these are the relationships. So this work, I really like, it just works for me. Uh, I think of it as a predictive model, but that's not quite right. So um, what uh, David Tongway and Norm Hindley did was they just kept measuring and measuring and measuring until they decided what the relationships were between what you see on the soil surface and those, those three critical foundations of uh, land health and biodiversity. So. Not very exciting, the first one. Um, you know, stability or lack of erosion is about cover. I don't meet anyone that doesn't know that um, with the people that I work with, but a lot of people pretend or ignore it. So, um, you know, we're still cropping, we're still grazing, we're still doing all those things that uh, result in no ground cover. And most of it um, I describe as bare ground agriculture in that there's no cover between the plants, so either between the perennial grasses or the crop plants. So most of Australia is managed like that. Water infiltration. Now, this is sort of a bit more involved, but it's the basal cover of perennial grass. So this material is for a grassland. Uh, I'll talk about the implications for cropping. The... Um, how much of each acre is covered with mature perennial grass bases? So I'm doing my two centimetres conversion. Um, so three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. So uh, I'd say four square centimetres. So a mature grass that David Tongwe and Norm Hindley found was that even in quite arid areas is going to be around for more than one growing season or one, more than one year is usually a mature grass base. And they found that, um, so the basal cover, how much of each acre is covered with mature grasses is what this basal cover of perennial grass. And it has a really big impact on water infiltration. Um, they act, those mature perennials act as funnels into the soil. Um, their roots, if they're mature, they usually have bigger roots, bigger fibrous roots, all that type of stuff. So. Uh, this one here is that litter between the perennial grasses um, it needs to be grown in situ and it needs to be composting or decomposing to actively increase water infiltration. So it slows down the, the water, it, it reduces the impact of the raindrop and that decomposition keeps that soil surface open and, and porous. And then surface roughness. So these are the really big ones. I knew about the first four, but I didn't know that surface roughness had such an impact on water infiltration and, as we'll see, nutrient cycling. So, um, so yeah, so what's between the plants? A healthy grassland is covered with sort of more than 10% basal cover of perennial grass with decomposing litter in the intertussic space with roughness of uh, eight millimetres plus over a metre. So you have the, either the crowns of the perennial grasses or you have some texture on that soil. So, um, so that's what a healthy grassland looks like. Um, Graham, could I ask a quick question on roughness? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, does that would that include a rocky surface rocks, or or just and or other types of, I guess litter like shrubs or limbs or you know sticks and stuff like that? Would that all of that be included as roughness? Um, no, you'd probably pick that up as sort of that soil cover number one. Sort okay. of it allocates it differently. So, 
uh, you know, um, cow dung and all that sort of come in under that litter cover. Okay. You know, so, yeah. So, yeah, it just gets allocated and you don't count the litter twice and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think it's really worthwhile having a look at that material. And um, if you can't find it, 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 I have put the link there for where it is. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, I think that if you, once you read through that LFA manual, um, I think people go, oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so other things get allocated differently. But overall, if it's a grazing situation, it needs that mature perennial grasses, uh, decomposing litter, and a bit of roughness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the cropping people know that in Australia, they'll, they'll rough it up sort of to leave it over our summer when it's dry. Um, yeah, and because it stops that erosion and it, you know, does a few other things. Okay, okay. I can look that up. Thank you. I was just trying to get a picture in my head. Yeah. Well, this is the big one for me. This is what I'm really interested in is the nutrient cycle, the cycling. Um, there's a lot of people starting to talk about water, 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 I find. And David Tongway wrote to me that he was a little bit concerned uh, was I focusing just on um, water? And I said, no, no, I, I probably a little bit over-focused on nutrient cycling. But as soon as we start managing, we get uh, erosion very low, really high stability figures. So, But nutrient cycling is what drives the, um, the health of the soil and as well as sort of growing those plants that we need to be profitable. So again, the basal cover of perennial grasses, the impact of those fibrous roots is sort of poorly understood. In Australia, perennial grasses uh, it seems to be like the background music to our lives. I go, what do you see? And they go, oh, they, I almost think they think perennial grasses are like green paint over the landscape. Um, and uh, but yeah, so they're incredibly important for nutrient cycling. This litter cover, you know, that degree of decomposition is really important. There's a step change. So he has a, a they've got in landscape function, they've got a slight, uh, moderate, and extensive decomposition. And there's a step change in nutrient cycling when you go from slight decomposition, which is what you usually see, uh, to moderate decomposition. So this is what we use to do it. And again, uh, you get that surface roughness and the capture of um, you know, flow across the ground and things like that, which enhances those. At the same surface roughness, about 50% typically in the grasslands that I measure, 50% of the nutrient cycling is coming from the basal cover of the perennial grasses. And 50% is coming from the decomposition or composting of the litter. So that's, that's the relationships, and it's a bit of a simplified version, but if you get into that link, you'll see that it also includes cryptogams, crust brokenness, erosion, all those other indicators as well. I've just gone for the simplified thing and just tried to pick the major ones that I, I just find that that PowerPoint doesn't, that slide, which I really like, just doesn't work for people. So what are all the relationships to stability, infiltration, and nutrient cycling. So, okay, just a quick tour of uh, what we do. And I estimate it using, um, uh, using a modified version of the holistic management uh, monitor, biological monitoring sheet. So I've just mod modified it to include the different types of decomposition um, and taken a few things out that um, weren't as important. But with that form, I, I, can get, um, I can get ranchers and croppers to do 10 dart throws and tick the boxes. So they tick a box in here, what did the dart land in? What's the soil surface like? Is there annual soil movement, evidence of other animals and insects? Name of nearest perennial grass. Um, I've spent a lot of my time sort of doing that. So I tend to just go and tell them uh, to talk to our Department of Agriculture and get them to come out because it sort of uh, does a bit of back training with the uh, departments of ag. And then have you got a, a, you know, a range of ages? Are you getting seedlings, young and mature plants? And then 
Uh, I've colour coded it because I found that was quite hard. So the red dying at risk, recovering or regenerating for the blue. So, and then I give people a corrective action sheet. Um, so if you're not having seedlings, what's the cause of that? It's usually stock density too low. The animals are uh, not at high enough stock density and recovery is too short. So, you know, you need a range of that. If you're never going to re-sow your grass, uh, your pastures, you need to have seedlings coming through, you know, and then I go, okay, now we've got to that. We've got the measurement. We've got the corrective action. Now do a safe to fail trial, which is just a small trial. We, we all know about those. But uh, I find in Australia that there's sort of trial fatigue. Um, so when we're doing any, any training programs and things, I get that they have to sign and do a public commitment to actually um, to do trials. And if they don't do that, they don't become part of the group. Um, because, uh, yeah, they're just a bit over it and they want to do the whole place and that's not the purpose of what we're doing. Yeah, I really like it. This is sort of um, under a perennial grass plant, between perennial grass plants with no decomposing litter and you don't need to sort of be have a PhD in soil science to see that the one on the left has got better numbers than the one on the right. Uh, all the relationships have been understood. Uh, I typically use this one. There's a lot in the manual, but I use this one because, you know, we have, like you, I'm sure, a very big interest in carbon. And as the nutrient cycling goes up, the carbon goes up. There's a, a nice correlation between those. So, um, you know, the research is being done. It's peer-reviewed. Some of the agronomists in Australia go, oh, we don't like it, Graham. And I go, well, you don't get to choose. This is science. You know, if it's peer-reviewed, it's your standard, not mine. Yeah, so I, you know, because they think I'm sort of up the hippie end of agriculture, whereas I see myself as, um, you know, I was trained as an industrial chemist, did science at university. Um, I see that uh, I don't think of myself as sort of a hippie. Um, this is work with Sydney University's uh, project I worked with, with uh, Peter Ampt and Sarah Dumbus. And all we looked at was long-term uh, adopters uh, of, um, of rotational grazing. So they had to have been working for over 10 years. And then the comparison was with their neighbours that tended to do an ad hoc or a set stock um, um, uh, grazing management. And without adding any input, so these people had not put anything onto their land for 10 years, these were the results. The pH was higher. I get stuck because Peter Amp fought me on innovators and I said they were trained by people. They are not by definition innovators. So that's why I always get a bit funny about that. But the pH corrects. Um, and it keeps correcting further than that. But yeah, you know, a lot of our soils are very acidic. The phosphorus became more available and we've got results um, showing up to sort of 20, 25 years that the phosphorus continues to become more available. Uh, the nitrogen went up. Generally, it, it says organic nitrogen and the carbon went up. So this is what drew me to the conclusion that if you, if you increase landscape function, because we had all measured all the landscape functions, if you increase landscape function, it's impossible not to do this. But you have to increase landscape function. And most people sort of don't want to do that because it's, it's challenging and very inconvenient. So just the slide in here, this is this moderate decomposition visible fungal attack slight decomposition, and that's uh, a photo from one of Gabe Brown's uh, slides. So it's the common link between, we've got to stop practicing bare ground agriculture between the plants. Just another one, slight decomposing on the left, slight decomposition and, and raw litter on the right. Um, Graham, can I ask sure. It's sure, can I wanted to go all the way back. I'm sorry. I wanted to ask a question earlier about you had uh, some metrics there about cryptobiotic crust. 
And yes. I, had a re- I recently had a conversation with a producer where he found intact crust and cryptogram cover to be limiting in his mind. And he, he's a pig farmer and wanted that stuff broken up and bring in other species. And we, we had a long talk about that, about cryptobiotic crust. But I was wondering, and I know that in Australia you guys value it, especially because you're in such, such arid situations, um, much more so than I think than where we are in central Texas. But, uh, but I'm curious about your perspective on that. Have you seen producers who see cryptogram, cryptograms and cryptobiotic crust as a limitation? That, that was new to me. Yeah, actually the um, sort of the environmental uh, ecologists trained people really like them and the ranchers and farmers don't like them. Mm-hmm. So um, David Tongway, when I first heard him speak, he loves them. He thinks they're like the best thing that ever happened because of all those interactions and stuff sure, and he right. studies them in detail. The nitrogen, the nitrogen cycling, right? Yeah, but the but the the point um, the point that I make and and David agrees with me um, was that they don't provide enough nutrient cycling nor enough stability to actually restore land health. So they're like a holding pack. So, um, and I said to him, well, well, that was why I didn't like your work because you talked about too much about cryptogams and I don't like them. And he said, Graham. Just because I like them, that did not impact on um, what comes out in the LFA model. Do you know? Like, so he's saying they're separate things. So yeah. I'm not a fan. Um, they, you can, you still in Australia, you still get erosion underneath them, and eventually they'll break off. The soil washes away underneath them, and they fix a bit of nitrogen. And if I'm working with ranchers, I say to grow more. Cryptogam, so it's not something we can use um, in agriculture. So, but when we're working with an area that's covered with cryptogams, we go very steadily and don't break them all in one hit yeah, okay. uh, because you've got to replace them that's, with the uh, you know, higher landscape. That's concept. exactly what so I recommended I miss- because he well, he had these uh, he had hogs in these one sm- relatively small areas. And they were in there for two weeks, and I felt that that maybe that was pushing it a little too far. So I recommended maybe just breaking it up lightly. But from what I could tell, that would take a couple hours, and then I was like, "Oh, I gotta, you know, it's too much." Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. we were kind of on opposite ends of the. You know, I could yeah, say make a little like, space for safe space, or like you know, for germinating grasses, maybe you want a little bit of broken up. But, yeah, um, but, uh, but you need more of a yeah. uh, soil surface like that. I got into trouble because I work with a lot of people that love pigs. And I said, I have never seen pigs increase landscape function. And yeah, and if anyone um, can point me at that, then I'd be really happy. Well, that's and where I think that. maybe that's where I was telling them, like two hours. How about two hours? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then well, break it up and let's see what happens. But two weeks is like, ah, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's back to the Stone Age. Okay. Um, I'll just leave this in. I just got the life cycle of a perennial grass, but I've emphasized the litter in this out of Alan's book. Um, because we need the litter to increase the landscape function. So um, we generally agree on this sort of stuff. Uh, this is Alan's sort of definition when it looks like an ungrazed plant, when it's is, when it's recovered. And I said, and contains fresh yellow litter. Um, the first time I presented that to Alan, he thought it was a valuable addition to uh, his work. The second time he thought that it was unnecessary. So I'm not sure what. Uh, what's going on there um but yeah the first time in sort of australia thought it was fantastic so um and it depends on that leaf emergence rate which is what we're talking about so um i'll go on to the safe to fail trials i started working with a a, um, a a listed company that was um restoring these um areas of australia for the for the mammals you know we're world champions at mammal extinction in Australia. And, um, and which isn't such a great thing. Um, in Brazil, they weren't sure whether I was proud of it or not. So, um, but this was a, tr- a test area for their electric fencing design to keep the, the foxes and the rabbits and the cats out. So they fenced this area off like a tennis court. And then they did their trials of different fencing design. Um, but this, 
area was all this wards weed and um, and bush everywhere, except where they had um, this fenced area. They they allowed it to be grazed with kangaroos for one month out of twelve months, and it had all the higher successional uh, perennial grasses as well as ground cover as well as the the more palatable salt bush and all those bushes and things like that. So I've started to think about this in terms of, well, how can we be more active about it? And so this is um, Benjamin that I work with in Somaliland. He's on one of my um, mentoring programs um, and they couldn't get electric fencing when they started. So they built these wooden pens, but it was that typical arid bush sort of Somali land. So he put in a safe to fail trial and he really struggled to leave it. So I'm saying don't graze it for 12 months and he's going, nothing's happening. I need to graze it again. But this is what happened after 12 months. So hey Graham, this is for you. This is after 10 days of rain. So this was one of our safe to fails that failed. <laughs> but anyways, um, so this was a two, this was a one night crawl right here. And this one was a two night crawl. It's a completely different, I mean, look at it. It's, it's incredible. It's like almost, it's knee deep. It's completely, completely covered. Um, or whatever. But look at this one, which is interesting. This was two nights, completely different type of species. You can see a little bit of the wall. It's very interesting to me. Did the sound come through okay on that? Yeah. So this is why I say we need to do safe to fail trials. I don't meet anyone anywhere that assumed that you could do this in 12 months, that you could restore this desert area in Somaliland. Everyone knows, yeah, this is that Horn of Africa, the Suez Canal up there. Do you know, it is harsh. Do you know, uh, it's in terrible drought at the moment and stuff. And um, Benjamin's just come back to me because he needs more help. He went down the production pathway. He was speaking to another South African that um, who told him to push the stocking rate up and did all that, and it's crashed. So he's, he's come back sort of to talk to me. But I think that's what we need to know is that this response is not linear. This is not, you know, when you see this, you can understand why, you know, Northern Africa was the granary of the Roman Empire and, you know, Hannibal could feed and his armies and his elephants. You know, we can see that that is what it's supposed to be like. There's some really interesting things that he says in there. Uh, he's safe to fail that failed. And that was because the animals got back in at one stage. So he thought it had all failed. And I'd say, no, no, leave it, leave it, leave it. Um, the other thing is when he's looking down into the grass and he says whatever, that's because there's no litter in there. He knew I'd be looking for the litter. So he looked down, couldn't find the litter and goes, oh, whatever. And then the other one was they put that cage for two nights in that back that got those different plants and the other. This is what we need to do. This is how, what we need to discover what is the combination of recoveries, stock density and utilisation that rapidly regenerate grasslands? This is what we can do with these safe to fail trials. And then you try and chase that, but you've got to prove the concept. Um, I've been trying to explain to people, we get myth busters over here. And um, you know, it's like going and getting a bigger bomb. It's not to prove that it doesn't work, it works everywhere. What you try to do is discover what does and what doesn't work. Um, this is just, uh, I might just skip over this and just include it in the notes. So it's just looking at the time. Um, I'm happy to go on for longer if people are uh, wanting to. Um, this is just sort of moving the animals uh, the way we manage. Um, just a short video showing a night move into a bigger area using 100 metre wide strips, 10 metre long sections, five to six moves a day. That's the movement that the cattle are doing. So they come in from there. 
Um, the water's just on the left, sorry, in the ring there. It's um, portable water, so they can always go back to it. We back, don't back fence, but they're always up moving uh, where we're wanting to go. Um, I can guarantee that if you manage like this, it'll work. Uh, this is an automatic gate lifter to reduce the number of trips out to shift them. Um, so it was programmed for seven o'clock to go off and they all start drifting through. I really like the way the calves run up from in the background and even all the stragglers and that everyone moves together. Um, I'd like you to note the colour of where we've been and where we're going to because it's really important that if we're going to do this sort of grazing we've got to mimic nature. I think we've forgotten what nature looks like so I've just clipped in a little section of the Great Plains video here showing the stock density uh, that they manage at and also that colour change from uh, from the left to the right. Um, yeah, so this is the sort of management. We know that during the drought, this is drought proof. It's very low risk. It's always profitable, low cost of production, uh, really good uh, sleepability as uh, a friend of mine would say because um, you know the animals are going to be well, effectively no animal health issues. That does take some skills. And There's a bit of an ad comes up after that, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, but that's sort of what we do. What these safe to fail trials teach you is what the land needs, and but the problem is that it's incredibly inconvenient and the barrier becomes that uh, fencing and water. Um, I keep saying to people, if you're not prepared to do safe to fail trials, if you're not prepared to put in convenient fencing and water, if you're not prepared to change your animal type, I wouldn't start down this pathway because it'll break your heart. You're better off staying where you are. Um, and then I usually finish with, I hope I'm not overselling grazing management. So, um, but I'm trying to get people to realise that it will work this is sort of that non-wetting sands, always just grew uh, what we call cape weed, did a safe to fail trial on it. Within three months, it was back to grass. This is in the Midlands of Tasmania. We do these trials at the extremes because you're not trying to find out what you can do on the rest of the property. You're trying to get information on how does the land respond um, to this type of management and what you're going to need. So I really liked it that they were all looking at the camera. Um, and again, sort of, you know, they're uh, just relaxed and inquisitive. So we put them in at that stock density in these safe to fail trials for three, four hours. Typically don't need water if they're only in there. People have to monitor them. I say they've got to do it during daylight hours. This isn't the thing you put them in at night. And you actually then are trying to mimic what was on that. Uh, David Attenborough Great Plains video um, and leave the soil covered but really well impacted. So a deep muscle massage um, so that that, uh, that promotes germination. There's, a th there's thresholds all the way through this. Uh, the response isn't linear. There's a threshold over which you'll promote the germination of perennial grasses and not annual grasses and forbs. There's another one that actually gets the litter so you're trying to discover what that is on your land through these trials. So I think of them as like, um, and this I got this from David Snowden, that they're like marker boys in the channel um, as, you, as you go into the estuary. And you, some you steer towards, some you steer away from. So the ones that head you more towards that increasing landscape function, you'll do more of that. The ones that head you away from it, you do more, uh, you, you, sorry, you, the ones you head away from that you're going, oh, that didn't increase it or it was too high a stock density or it was for too long or the recovery was too short. So you need, usually typically need a range, but if people won't do a range and I can get them to put in one, I'll do, um, I'll get them to do one on 12 months because usually um, from 12 months recovery, they can see how the land responds. So I go, it mightn't be right for your land, but you'll be able to see what is right for your land from there. Um, and then keep the ground covered um, and just try and get them to put in that really high stock density. 
This was monitoring a couple of um, a, a couple of weeks ago. It was a hard frost in the morning down in the Midlands in Tasmania. This is outside the trial area. You can still see the drill rows um, of where they sowed this, but inside this has now gone to this material and it's ready for another graze, but he hasn't had animals back in this area. Um, and we monitored it. That was doing a landscape function measurement with um, the transect and things like that, but completely different look. And that's what you're trying for. You're not, I'm trying to say to people, what we want to be able to do is look at this and say, oh, I get it. It's actually, if I could get to that stock density, that recovery, that plant utilization, I'd be able to get that. Just a cattle example. So this is just using a, a big strip, 100 meter wide strip uh, with a front fence and no back fence. The water's back over here and these animals are going back to, to get a drink here and they all get a drink. So they've just had a ship. Uh, there's no back fence holding them in. Uh, they're all up eating. Uh, they can choose to go back. And as soon as they've finished that, a few will wander back and lounge around. Uh, but then, but that we found that works really well for rapidly regenerating grasslands. Um, uh, I was just going to talk, uh, I won't talk about that. I've already talked about that using them as navigation aids. Um, just some of these, principles for designing it. So my understanding now is that, um, and I can actually understand why I upset so many people along the way, is that in the complex areas that we work in, which uh, ranching and farming are, it's, it's very complex, but it's also where conflict exists. So these trials are also a way of reducing conflict. So before opinions harden, you create a simple decision rule. What I find is that they harden so quickly, I don't know how you get to that step. But this is what, um, this is what uh, Dave Snowden does. So everyone that wants to try something. So one of the big things in Australia is our bushfires. You know, so I'm saying we need to increase biological decay of the uh, of the fuel loads, and everyone says no, or other people say no. We need to burn more. Well, before we argue about it, I say let's do a safe to fail experiment based on you know those two things and see see who's right and who's wrong. Um, they've got to be small. They've got to be safe to fail. I think it's really important that language that if that if that land never ever grew another plant or whatever, it wouldn't matter um, because it's such a small experiment. And you want fast feedback, so that's why I go for that. We're lacking high quality fast feedback, and that's also why I put in that Benjamin video. You know, you need that result in twelve months. Um, a lot of the people that I work with, that, that's code for men, that if it takes five years, it's too long for them. They want 12 months. Oh, got it. Um, it's got to be observable. Um, I say it's got to be measurable, but, you know, it's just got to be observable. So what's, you know, each trial, it's got to have something you can measure. So if we're going to do a small trial or look at, you know, uh, trial and error or whatever it is, what is it that you're going to measure? Um, and then, you know, you're sort of trying to keep the costs and the resources and that low because everyone's land act, reacts differently. So I really like that definition of complexity is that the definition of insanity does not apply. You can't do the same thing twice. So on a ranch, either the seasons have changed, the plants have changed, the soils changed, the animals have changed, or you're at a different biological time of the year. So uh, the people that I train, I say, you need to listen. If your trainer says, oh, that's the definition of insanity, you'll be able to say, oh, you don't understand complexity. So I try and get them fired up before they get them out into the world. So. So this is this idea, it's a very simple idea, it needs some structure, 
I say those fences that you build for, like, for those sheep in this photo, they've got to be good enough fences that you could store hay or silage or something in there and the animals wouldn't get in to get it. And it needs to be long-lived enough that it's actually going to be there for about 10 years. So you want these areas to always be steering always be telling you oh it's not um it's not the season it's not what i did that area is going well you've always got these comparisons versus um what you're doing i i used to know that i wasn't managing very well on the rest of the of the ranch when i couldn't look at them i'd pretend they weren't there i'd look away because they would be, I'd say they, they're laughing at me because they're not suffering from low rainfall or, or, you know, they were always looking vibrant and green. You can spot these areas that we've done this work from Google Earth. That's what they need to be different from what you're doing elsewhere. That's why the ranch or the whole property cannot be the safe to fail trial because it's the variation. It's those variations that allow you to drive management in a way that's positive and that makes rapid changes. So we only understand complex systems by interacting with them. Cause and effect is only loosely coupled in the complex system. So we need to know that you have to do these trials and they should have that con contradictory. You, you really want them to be actually sort of, you know, designed so that you, I think of them as bookends, you know, recovery too short, recovery too long, stock density too low, stock density too high, utilisation, you know, like all that sort of idea. Um, I won't go through all of them, but you can read them. And you want some, um, about 20% of them to fail. And like a lot of the people that are doing good work are always doing trials on, on things that fail. And I'm sure um, you know about that. Um, these are the four, and I won't, so just in terms of time, I won't spend too much time on them, but that's, this is what I do with people. So put in a safe to fail trial, look at sort of what a better recovery stock density and utilisation than what you're currently doing. I have not found anywhere that we can't put in a trial that's better than their current practice. This is even for the grazing gurus, um, even for myself. Do you know, like, these safe to fail trials are better than what you're currently doing. If it's better, what do you learn from that? So rapidly regenerating that land, knowing that there's these thresholds that above which you promote the germination of the perennial grass seed bank and not all the, every thistle and forb and weed that you don't want. Um, then trial some designs because one of the things is people make the strips either too narrow or too wide. So you've got to do some strips. You've got to develop this convenient infrastructure. And I'll come back to this on the next slide. Um, so that you can put this evidence that you've obtained from your trials into practice, you need flexible strip, strip fencing and flexible water. One of the... Um, one of the farmers in Western Victoria, he keeps subdividing his paddocks. And I just, I said, oh, I really like it, Stephen. You make me that angry. It makes me really clear. I said, stop subdividing. You're going to be a thousand years old before you have enough paddocks. You've got to go to something that allows you that variation. Don't go for cells. Don't go for um, subdividing your current paddocks into smaller paddocks go for something like electric fencing to do the trials to see what works and then selecting the animal phenotypes that thrive under this management. So when I'm working with people, this is uh, work done um, um, by Doug McKenzie Moore. So the barriers to adoption um, are, are really high um, and it's really inconvenient. So. When I first started and was surveying people on what were their barriers and it's really hard to find out, I thought it was lack of motivation and lack of knowledge. It's really neither of those. The number one is uh, that convenient infrastructure, that bottom line. Then it becomes lack of knowledge. Then they forget to act. They forget to 
be looking at the weather forecasts, they forget to look at the seasonal forecasts and take corrective action based on that. Um, so this is the number one barrier I find, and you can overcome the, the uh, design problems and the need for this by making sure that you do those safe to fail trials at two levels, a small area, and then some strips so that people start to get that information. Um, I really, I, for my sins, I do a lot of work with horse people and you know, there's always got a reason why they can't have those two horses together or you know, they'll eat one another's rugs or they'll kick or, you know. But um, I'll send through some videos that I've done and they've actually got through that and now um, grazing their horses in a better way and their horse health is getting better as well as the land. Um, so, yeah, so this work by Doug Mackenzie Moore is really important, I think. I used to blame people for not being committed and I'd focus on, um, you know, they need to improve their goals. And I find that that's not at all the barrier. It's actually knowing this material. Uh, this is the difference, I think, between um, uh, language-based change and action-based change. So I keep saying it's hard, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking rather than think your way into a new way of acting. Because if you sit and think, you just never get there. You're not picking up these thresholds. There's a whole number of reasons. So I'm just getting people to act. Um, and that's borrowed from Dave Snowden as well as uh, Doug McKenzie Moore, who this material is from. This is, the, uh, this is a property. Um, that we're leasing, uh, we call it leasing sort of, you know, so renting it from the farmer. I've worked with him for 20 years and they uh, want to pull back and they want to, to, to continue on. So this is the fencing that they've got and this is how we design fencing. I just lay a grid overlay over the Google Earth and then stretch it so that you're getting, this is about 100 metre wide um, um, grids on it and then move it around. So, you know, it's probably going to line up something like this in this area, and then we'll put another one and line it up like that in this area, and then, you know, still working on this, on which way is the most efficient and things like that. So it needs lots of subdivision. Um, I'd love um, there to be uh, virtual fencing, and I think I'll get the virtual fencing um, when I get my jetpack and my flying car. So um, I don't think it's going to come through any soon. So sorry, I've, I've probably gone over.